Kodachrome. They give us those nice bright colors. They give us the greens of summer and makes you think all the world is a sunny day. Those are lyrics taken from Paul Simon's 1973 track titled Kodachrome. It's pretty crazy to consider that a film stock can have such a significant cultural impact that it inspired not only a song about how great it is, but also inspired the name of a state park. Now, when you take into consideration that at the time of its discontinuation, Kodachrome was the longest running film brand in the world, lasting 73 years, and that it was one of the best selling photographic products and one of the most iconic of all time, it's not that far of a stretch of the imagination. Kodachrome was not the first color photography process in existence. In fact, far from it. There were other much older processes that had been around, some of them for decades, and that photographers and chemists had been experimenting with, such as autochromes, trichrome, and Dufay color processes. The problem with all of these processes is not only were they very, very clumsy, difficult to work with, and some of them requiring multiple exposures that had to be lined up again afterwards, leaving huge margins for error, they were very clumsy and did not deliver very good results. Despite this, the desire to shoot in film remained. The word Kodachrome first appeared when John Kapstaff of Kodak coined the word to name his invention of a single exposure color photography process that works by stacking an orthochromatically sensitive plate on top of a panchromatically sensitive plate with a red filter in between. Once developed, the orthochromatic plate would then be tinted blue-green and the panchromatic plate would be tinted red-orange. These two would then be stacked and a strong light would be shone through them which would project a color image with reasonably good color representation, especially for skin tones, which was rather surprising considering that it was only using two colors. However, it still wasn't perfect. Colors weren't 100% accurate. This product went on sale to the general public in 1915 and was later adapted to a cine film format. It was two years later in 1917 when Leopold Godofsky Jr. and Leopold Mance were attending the showing of a color motion picture where they decided to begin embarking on their own journey towards inventing a color photography process because they were very disappointed by the way that color was represented in the film that they had seen. They envisioned a process by which three separate emulsions, each sensitive to red, green, or blue, with dye couplers for each respective color built into the emulsion, would be stacked on top of each other on a single film substrate. This would then allow for efficient developing of a single color image without the need for multiple exposures while still representing the full color spectrum. Now this idea had already been worked on by Rudolf Fischer, a German photographer and scientist. However, he couldn't solve the problem of the dye couplers wandering from one layer of the emulsion to another, resulting in undesired colors once the film was developed. In 1922, thanks to an introduction from Mann's friend Robert Wood, Kenneth Mies provided Godofsky and Mann's with a three-layer emulsion made to their specification, starting off Godofsky and Mann's relationship with the company Kodak. By 1929, Godofsky and Mance were running out of money and they still hadn't developed a viable product. Kenneth Meese invited them to join Kodak and to work for them, developing their product for the company. He offered to settle their $20,000 debt and to work at Kodak with a three-year guaranteed salary because Leslie Brooker, one of Kodak's scientists, had solved the dye coupler wandering issue. The dye couplers would be added to the emulsion after exposure and not to the emulsion directly, preventing them from wandering from one layer to another. After an extension of the project in 1933, and after nearly launching an inferior two-color product in 1934, Godofsky and Mann surprised everyone at Kodak by delivering the long-awaited, and not really expected anymore, much superior three-color version of their original idea. Which meant that finally in 1935, recycling the name that Capstaff had invented, Kodachrome arrived on the market as a commercially available single exposure color photography product. Kodachrome launched in 16mm motion picture format with an ASA of only 10. The following year in 1936, 35mm 
stills photography and 828 stills photography formats were added as well as 8mm motion picture film. Kodachrome was an almost instantaneous smash hit, becoming the first commercially successful color photography product of all time. And boy did it ever deliver on its promise. It rendered naturalistic, good-looking colors with excellent contrast and sharpness without the need for multiple exposures or the use of filters. The original film was able to deliver its fantastic color reproduction thanks to the very complex development process called K11 process, which was a process that Kodak maintained an exclusive monopoly on. Every single roll of Kodachrome was sold with the development costs built in, as well as with the mailer that you could send it back to Kodak, where they would then process the film and send it back to you. Each roll of film cost at the time $3.50, which is about $60 to $65 in today's money, which is just absolutely astronomical. However, this would end in 1954, when the prices would be cut roughly in half, after Kodak lost an anti-competition lawsuit against the United States federal government, preventing them from not allowing other photo labs to develop Kodachrome. Throughout its early years, Kodachrome gained massive popularity and a lot of attention for its beautiful characteristics. Throughout the 1960s and to the end of the 1970s, Kodachrome came into what would be its best years. A massive boom in vacation culture spurred on the desire to photograph more of life's moments than ever before. Slide film was at its all-time high, and 8mm and Super 8mm home movie film was at its most popular. This and the increasing number of easy-to-use SLRs and the development of automatic exposure led to just an absolutely massive expansion of the film stock across the market. Photographers at home as well as photojournalists and high-end professionals loved Kodachrome. The film was used from capturing everything from baby's first steps all the way to the color portraits of presidents. In addition to the unique and beautiful color rendering of the film, Kodachrome was particularly prized among photojournalists and professionals for its long-lasting archival stability. Because the dyes were only added to the film after exposure during the development process, there were no excess dyes in the film itself to degrade the image over time. Calculations estimate that the yellow dye, which is the most volatile and least stable, would only lose about 20% of its overall color over the course of 185 years. In 1961, Kodachrome version 2 was brought to the market with an increased ISO of 25 as well as improved sharpness and contrast, bringing with it the K12 development process. The following year, in 1962, Kodachrome X was announced with a new high speed of ASA 64. A few years later, in 1974, Kodak would revise the development process one more time, bringing it up to the K14 process, which would remain with the film until its eventual discontinuation. Kodachrome 2 and Kodachrome X were replaced with Kodachrome 25, 40, and 64. In 1986, Kodak would go on to announce one of the last versions of Kodachrome and the highest speed variant ever to come into existence, Kodachrome 200. However, by the early 1980s, it was clear that Kodak Chrome's reign as the king of all color films was starting to come to an end. Declining sales were largely being taken over by products such as Fujichrome, Agfa Chrome, and Ektachrome that were rapidly replacing Kodachrome as the slide film of choice for many photographers, including ones who had made a career using Kodachrome, especially, notably, Steve McCurry, who even went back to photograph the very famous Afghan girl years later using the Ektachrome film. These new slide films had a significant advantage over Kodachrome in the fact that they used the much less complex E6 development process that could even be done at home, unlike the very complicated K-series processes such as the K14 one that Kodachrome was using at the time that required very complex development, sophisticated machinery, and highly trained staff 
to fill the facilities that process these film stocks. The increasing popularity of one-hour photo places also didn't help. Kodachrome could simply not be developed that quickly. The eventual addition and rise in popularity of color negative film, replacing slide film as the main film of choice, also continued to eat away at Kodachrome's market even more. Another dent to Kodachrome came with the replacement of Super 8 as the main medium for making home movies through VHS systems. And then eventually digital photography took over and that had of course the impact that we all know on the film market and Kodachrome's market share just continued to shrink and shrink and shrink. This decline in popularity was evidenced by the fact that on July 25th, 2006, the Lausanne processing facility in Switzerland closed down, leaving only one place in the entire world where Kodachrome could be developed. Duane's photo in Parsons, Kansas. By 2009, Kodachrome only represented a fraction of 1% of Kodak's annual sales. And on June 22nd of that year, Kodak announced they would be ceasing all production of Kodachrome. The last roll of Kodachrome ever made was given to Steve McCurry, who had it developed on July 14th, 2010 at Duane's Photo in Parsons, Kansas. And with that, Kodachrome was officially dead. Kodachrome may have been discontinued for some time now, but with film emulation it's still possible to create Kodachrome-like images digitally using a tool like Dehancer. Dehancer is a film emulation plugin available for Adobe Photoshop and Lightroom as well as Capture One and Affinity Photo, plus there is an easy to use mobile app for on the go available as well. The plugin comes with 63 different film and film print profiles, allowing you to realistically emulate a variety of different film stocks, including popular ones like Portra 400, Cinestill 800T, Ilford HP5, and of course, Kodachrome 64. The Kodachrome results in particular look pretty convincing to me, not quite perfect, but certainly getting close to the look and feel of Kodachrome. If you'd like to give Dehancer a try, you can use code Aperture Dundee to get 10% off, excluding the mobile app version. Thank you to Dehancer for supporting this YouTube channel. Generally, I'm someone who shoots black and white, and don't shoot very much color, so color films aren't something that I pay that much attention to, but the fact is, Kodachrome is a film that I'm very sad I missed out on. Sure, you can still buy Kodachrome on the used market at places like eBay, stuff that's been unexposed and sitting in someone's fridge or freezer for a really, really long time. And you can definitely put it in a camera and expose it, but there's simply no way to develop it, unless you want to use one of the hacks that people have come up with to develop it as a black and white film, but I simply don't see a point. Unfortunately, I was still too young to really know or even care when Kodachrome was discontinued. Since its discontinuation, there have been a number of rumors about Kodachrome coming back. Certain Kodak high-level executives dropping the odd hint here or there, especially with a lot of hope coming when Ektachrome was revived in 2017. However, the fact remains that I don't think Kodachrome is ever going to come back, not just because of the complexity of the processing that needs to be done, but also I think because of the prohibitive cost that it would take for Kodak to actually bring this film and the processing facilities needed to develop it back to life, which would inevitably be cut passed on to the consumer. And I think Kodak is looking at that, and even if they had the ability to bring it back, technically speaking, the costs of doing that would simply be in the way. It was expensive when it was first announced, and with film prices already being as high as they are for conventional film stocks now, I can't even imagine what a roll of Kodachrome would cost if they were to bring it back. 
But at the end of the day, it's sad that a film that was this mm-hmm. iconic and had this significant of an impact on the 20th century and on the way that we now look back towards the 20th century is gone probably forever.